Well, greetings. Welcome to Theology 101. This is, Lord willing, the first or the introductory course in theology. The big question we must answer is, what is theology? Maybe uh, many of us will have different understandings of what theology is. The answer is really not a simple one. But when I use the word in its fullest sense, in its grandest sense, the word signifies everything. Everything that we do, every aspect of our life, in the Christian life and in the Christian world. So theology encompasses everything we do. That's in its grand sense. Some call it a worldview. Maybe some of you are familiar. And that's basically how one sees the world. What's your, what's your outlook on the world? And there are other worldviews. The pagan has his worldview. Their worldview sounds something like this. How can I get the mass to believe there is no God? And how can I get the mass to worship me? That's the pagan's worldview. What about the humanist or humanist worldview? For them, there's nothing supernatural. Everything is natural to them. And we see scientists today in that mindset. The motto is, the natural man. All is natural. Their creed sounds like this. What's in it for me? What is in it for me? But the question is, is what about the believer? The true Christian believer also should have his worldview, how you look at the world through your eyes, and it should be different, and it should be something like this. How can I live my life to the glory of God? How can I live my life to the glory of God? Not just, how can I live my life to the glory of God on Sunday when I'm meeting the believers, and then I go out the door and I live like the pagan or the humanist. No, that's not what we're to do. But our entire life and being, everything we do should glorify the Lord. Everything. When you're going to the store, whatever it would be, when you're driving your car, do it unto the Lord for the glory of the Lord. And so, theology in its grandest sense is a way of life. When we wake and take our first breath, remember it's God who created that air that you're breathing. It's God who created it. And he sustains the life by giving you that breath. Your body is a miraculous work of God. And in a sense, it's theology. When we think about our bodies, this is a, the a theological creation that God has blessed each and every one of you with. The sun as the center of the universe is theology. In the sense, because God put it there and God sustains it every second that it shoots out light. It's God. It's all about God. God sustains it, and it's all about God. That said, though, this course is looking at theology in a more strict sense, in a smaller sense. And before I explain first, I want to answer this question. What is the big idea of this course in theology? Or the grand goal of the course here? I'll answer by way of an illustration. The reformers, those men who wanted to empower the church back in the 1500s to get back to its roots, had a powerful idea and a powerful goal. It was this, to put back into the hands of the, every believer God's special revelation. The Word of God. The people didn't have the Word of God back then. It was only for a select few. It started out that way when the apostles originally wrote down the scriptures and, and, uh, and it followed that way for many years. It was lit, written in a common language for the common man in a language called Kone Greek. Kone Greek means common Greek. It's everyday street language of the people. In other words, there was no communication yet. The word went forth, it hit the ears, and they knew what it meant. But there was a split in the Roman Empire. The West in Italy spoke Latin at one time. And the East, the Eastern Empire, spoke Greek. They spoke the language of the Bible. But Latin became the prevalent language of the church. The, the church proper, we call it the Catholic Church or whatever. At that time, the East was separated and finally it was almost snuffed out, the Eastern Church uh, that spoke that Greek language. Koine Greek almost entirely disappeared. We couldn't interpret the, uh, the Bible in Greek. They thought it was a Holy Ghost language, as if it was a special language, until they started seeing 
you know, manuscripts upon manuscripts in the Greek language. Well, enter the Dark Ages. Rome declined and deteriorated drastically. Everything became dark, learning-wise, you know, uh, biblical-wise. The church became more and more a corrupt institution at this time and was really totally separated from the people. And then at that point, the common man didn't even speak Latin. He didn't, you know, I don't know if you remember, when I was little, I used to go to church and they would speak Latin in the Catholic church. I had no idea what they were saying as, as I listened to the church. And it was like that for thousands of years. Man was foreign to what was happening in church. Soon, no one except the institutional church read the Bible and they were literally chained to the pulpits. I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of Bibles chained to the pulpits. And if you touch that Bible, who knows what would happen to you. As time went on, slowly but surely, by God's grace, men arose who saw the sinful state of this, that man didn't hear the word in his, in his tongue, and man didn't have the word to read for himself. They saw the sinfulness of this. The first ones were John Wycliffe, and John Huss, these were the first ones who says, hey, we got to do something about this. We have to give the man his biblical in, into his own tongue, into his own language, that he, the Bible in his own language, that he could understand. Luther went on to translate it in, they translated into English, you know, uh, Old English, but Luther translated the whole Bible into German. The corrupted institutional church of Rome hated this. They wanted to see nothing of that. They wanted to be the ones, I'm going to be the one who tells you what this says, and I'm going to be the one who tells you what your doctrines are. They wanted to, in other words, control things. They wanted to control. They feared, at the bottom line, that they would lose power. They would lose the power over the people. But Luther insisted that mankind had the word of God. He, he insisted upon this. When men could read the word for themselves with the help of the Holy Spirit, something happened. There was reformation. There was revival, revival within the people. With the, and, and then with the invention of the printing press, then it just exploded. Bibles were printed. Yes, they were expensive at first, but it was in the hands of every, every church had a Bible. People could touch it again, learn how to read it again. And that's what sparked the Reformation that the world has never known. Never known something greater than that, except maybe in the original days of the Gospel, but then it was in a certain area. Now the Reformation was going throughout the world. So, you know, Switzerland, England, even, up, even into the, to the New World. The doctrines were, dis were, were restored one by one. The Reformers worked on all of the doctrines that, that, uh, that Rome had corrupted over the time. The Reformers' idea and goal succeeded magnificently. People had the word in their hands again. The believers could read the word for the first time in thousands of years. Could you imagine that? Thousands of years reading the word for the first time. You are blessed. You have the Bible in Spanish and you know, Haitian or whatever, whatever tongue, you know, Chinese, every language we have it translated in. The Reformation was, was achieved and it is still reforming today. We are reforming. We're still getting back to the original, to what it was. Well, brethren, just like the Reformers had an idea and had a goal, we also here at Bread of Life have an idea and a goal. And it's simply this, to get into your hands the tools that are really only given to a certain few men, to some, you know, mainly pastors, the tools for understanding the word more fully and better in your brain that you, that, that you could start to have these resources to get into your hands the same tools but with a twist we won't just give you seminary scholastic education sometimes that develops just into head knowledge and a, and a really a dissociation with the people of God we're going to have a, tr a twist on what's going on there and that's what we want to do here. That's what we want to achieve. And that twist is to practically work out these things in our lives. In other words, learn these intense things, but not just leave them in our heads, but put them in our hearts and, and, and put them to work. Practical, in other words, practical theology. Where a seminary tends to, to, learn, to lean towards scholastic theology. And they get deep into it, very deep into it. 
We want to get the tools in your hands, but get you to be practicing these things also in your lives, to transform each of your hearts, and in turn, transform your walk in life, to transform your walk and who you are, so others can see you. So that you'll not only have orthodoxy in a good sense. Orthodoxy means right doctrine, correct doctrine. But you'll also walk these things out in your life. You'll work them out. And even further, it's our goal that you would have the right passion for these things. Not just learn this to have head knowledge, but a right passion to put these things together in your life and to work them out in your day-to-day -day walk with the outcome of nothing less than reformation in each of your lives. That's the goal here. Reformation in your individual lives. That's awesome. With the outcome of nothing less than that. Lord willing, you in turn will spark reformation in those around you and your family members and uh, those you associate with. Maybe a lot of the men here go out evangelizing. That you would spark reformations, not just give them... Uh, salvation, which is wonderful, but also to give them the tools to live their life. Not just say, okay, you're saved, okay, go go wherever, see you later. That's what the evangelism tends to do a lot of times, you know? But realize, brethren, we are not, this is not a new invention here. I'm not coming up with something new here, that, that uh, this is the first time this has ever happened. No, this is not a new course. Theology has been building Ever since man was created, from the very first man in the garden, theology has been growing and been given to man in spurts. We call it progressive revelation. We'll get into that in a moment. So, it, it came to its climax, to its head, about 2,000 years ago, when the scriptures were complete. That's where we get all of our theology from. We don't get our theology from what they call natural theology, the world the stars. Yes, man can see that God exists from the plants, from the stars, from the sun. Man is uh, can see that, but we're going to be working from special revelation, the scriptures. Simply put, brethren, your Bibles. That's where we get our theology from. The theology of exegetical theology. The theology of Systematic theology, we'll get into these terms in a moment. Even biblical theology, there's a term called biblical theology. It's all drawn from the Bible. God's special revelation. Remember that, when you talk about your Bible, it's God's special revelation to each of you. So you don't have to get it from the guy who, he knows the mysteries. I'm going to be the mystery revealer, and I'm going to give you all the revelation. No, you got the revelation in your hands. That's wonderful, brethren, eh? But further, Lord willing, the Lord saw fit to bless his church with teachers. So you not only have the Bible in your hands, you also have teachers and pastors who the Lord empowered. There were some great, great teachers through the ages. I mean, unbelievable people. People like, not in themselves, but who the Lord blessed to work through. People like Luther, people like Calvin, and on and on and on. Not just to pick out those two but who gave them understanding that sometimes we just don't have. And what we're doing in this class is building on these men or sitting at their feet, either standing on their shoulders or sitting at their feet, whatever way you want to look at it. And, uh, and Ephesians 4.11 is a great text. Write that down. I'm going to read it. Ephesians 4.11 says, And he himself, speaking about God, gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. God has, has blessed the body with men who can teach. Who can teach. Those empowered teachers built on what the apostles has, had given us in their hands. They built on this stuff throughout the church age. And it's still happening today. People are still building on what the apostles had given us. The theology that we will be learning, remember this, comes from Scripture. It's not an invention of me or an invention of uh, you know, Luther or an invention of Calvin or anybody who, who you think would be high up there as a teacher. And I like the way the Westminster Confession of Faith lays it out. It's in the Westminster Confession of Faith, number 1, chapter 1, verse 6, it says, The whole counsel of God 
concerning all things necessary for his own glory. Man's salvation, faith in life, is either expressly written down in the scripture by good or by good and necessary consequence, may be deduced from the scripture. So some things are plain, like salvation is plain. A little child can understand salvation. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, you know, and, and repent of your sins. You don't need no theologian to, to tell you what that means. But some things are more hard. And, and, and Peter mentioned this about Paul, remember? I believe it's in uh, one, of, one of Peter's epistles. Some things in Scripture are hard. And, and, the, and the Westminster Confession goes on to say in, in number seven, it states that all things in Scripture are not alike plain in themselves, nor alike clear unto themselves. I'm sure you've read the Bible. I had a friend one time, he says, he says, man, I read Paul and I sit there and I scratch my head. <laughs> I don't know what he means. So some things are not as clear as we would like them to be. You know, the blessing of godly teachers has blessed the body. That's without a doubt. And it's still blessing the body today. To help the church understand these things. Yes, the gospel, as I said, itself is plain and simple. It's plain and simple. But it all comes down, brethren, to the scriptures themselves. And we know this. Men are imperfect, but the scripture is perfect unto God. It's perfect. It's a perfect word. So, this is the source that all theology grows from. We'll get into, there's, there's, there's a few aspects that are a little different than that. We'll get into it in a minute. But, some through the ages, and even many today, have, have questioned the need for theology. You ever meet somebody who says, what do we need this stuff for? What am I going to learn this stuff and I'm going to start arguing with everybody? You know, there's so much, you've heard this stuff, right? Correct? In your lives? What do we need? Or think theology is outright bad. You've heard this. They say, just give me Jesus. One famous a pa a pastor's daughter. Just give me Jesus. In other words, that's all you need. Well, I got news for these people. Jesus is theology. Jesus is theology. Jesus is doctrine. He's just not a thing. He is these things. In fact, theological thoughts flow from even his name since it flows forth from the word. You know, theology, the word means theologos. It comes from that, that term in Greek, theologos. And basically, it means it's God's words. God's words. God's spoken words. In fact, Jesus is the word. You've heard that in John chapter 1, right? It says Jesus is the logos. It's actually the same word in the Greek language. Jesus is the logos. The very word we get theology from. So, in fact, those people who say this, just give me Jesus, I don't want theology, they're standing on theology. They just don't know it. Their theology is very, very small and little, in fact. But it is theology. You can't get away from it. Not at all. You see, theology is the English word derived from the Latin theologia and further from the Greek word theologos. Theo means God, as I said, and logos means word. Or the study of God, we can say. The study of God. It could also be translated as the science of God. And we'll get into that in a moment. Don't let that stumble when somebody says the science of God. And through the ages of the church, there are approximately four views of theology. I'll do this quick. Thomas Aquinas, very heavy theologian from the 13th century, said theology is sacred doctrine, sacred teachings, in other words. And he defined it like this a unified science in which all things are treated under the aspect of God. He's looking at theology, in other words, in that grand, that grand sense. Like I said in the beginning, everything we do. That's how uh, Aquinas looked at theology. He speaks of it in that sense, and he uses the word science. Second one, many of you heard the name Charles Hodge. He was an old Princeton theologian from the 19th century. He defines theology very similar, but he goes further. The science of the facts of divine revelation. In other words, from your Bibles. He's restricting theology more, as we do, from the word of God. And so we're closer to Hodge. But there also, there also are others who use this. And one of them was the, the famous Puritan William Ames. In his definition, he, he really has a practical definition of theology. He says, theology is the doctrine or the teaching of living to God. It's all about, in Ames' life, 
You're, you're living to God. That means real practical theology. Aim shifted from the intellectual study to an experiential, in other words, an experiencing of theology worked out in your life. And the last one is John Frame. He's a Westminster theologian from California, still alive today. John Frame is in line also with Ames. And his definition is simply this. The application of the word of God by persons to all areas of your life. Everything you do. So in other words, you see the practicality of the theology in these, in these people? So we have two tendencies in theology. One tendency views it more as a science and more heady, uh, more things to learn in the head, and the other ones, aims and frame, use it more in a let's let's work this stuff out. Let's be let's 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 have practical theology, not just head theology in our lives. Well, how are we going to look at theology in this class, from the academic or from the practical? How are we going to do it? Well, in a sense, we're going to combine these both aspects together. We're going to combine these things, and frame does something similar to this. Yes, theology is a science, but not as a science is today, how people think of science. Like the botanist who takes the leaf and he's going to tear it apart. He's, he's the Lord over the leaf, in other words. He, we're not looking at science in that sense. Not at all. That's a man-centered view of science. We use science in the sense that we want to know God. We want to know God. That's our goal, to know Him as deeply as we can. And John chapter 17, jot this text down. John chapter 17, verse 3 declares this simple thing. This is a charge to each of you, my brethren. And it says this. And this is eternal life. That we know you, speaking of God, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. We want to know God. That's what we're doing here. This isn't just to, oh, I'm going to be a systematic theologian. I know all things theologically. No! No! We want to know God. Just like a husband would want to know his wife, or a wife would want to know, but more deeply than that even. More deeply. God's the object of our theology. It's Him. It's Him alone. And the Word of God is our resource. That's our, that's our toolbox. That's our gems. That's where we're getting our theology from. The Word of God alone. But never forget, God calls each of you to know Him. To know Him as best as you can, as John 17, verse 3 brings out. God calls every Christian to be what? A workman approved by God. To be entrusted with the good news. A workman approved. The workman works. He digs at his job, right? And that's what we want to do here. We want to give you the tools to be a good workman. And so, we use the word science in its simplest definition. You know, if you do a search on science, it simply means knowledge. That's all. It doesn't mean, you know, I'm putting on my microscope and I'm going to put God under the microscope. I'm going to be the Lord of the Lord. I'm going to tear him apart and break him break. No. Simply put, knowledge. So don't be scared of that word, science. And that we may know him through his holy scriptures. Psalm 119, 105 says, The word, speaking about the Bible, is a lamp unto my feet. The word of God is a lamp unto your feet, so that you know where you're walking. You know where you're walking, you know where you're coming from, and you know where you're going. Very important in life, brethren. And so, brethren, as we look forward, this science, as we shall see, is made of theologies itself. There's sub-theologies. One of them is systematic theology. That'll be our next class. Then the one after that is biblical theology. Don't get scared of these terms. You're going to use these terms like you drive your car. Like you drive your car to get from one place to another. Don't be scared of these terms. Exegetical theology will be a further class. Historical theology will be a yet further class. And our last class will be practical theology. Some call it pastoral theology. These are the sub-theologies under theology proper, as we'll explore in this course. And so we'll go about this as deeply as we can in an introductory course. This is just an introductory course. And then we'll get into these things individually, Lord willing, after this. Really just scratching the surface 
of these things, these tools, and getting our feet wet of what these things are, brethren. But each of you, remember this, each of you will grow in your knowledge of God. Not just grow in your knowledge of systematic theology. Not just grow in your knowledge of biblical theology or so forth, or historical theology. You'll grow in seeing the big picture of the Bible. You know, the Bible has a big story. And it's, and it's brought to you in all little parts. But it's a big story. It's a story of revelation, redemption. It's redemption from sin. That's the story in the Bible. You'll grow in your ability to tie scriptures together. Where you ever read a scripture and you say, how does that work with, you know, how does that work with this? You know, you know uh, James talks about we're saved by our works. Paul talks about we're, how does this, you know, we're saved by our faith. How, how, who's right? Well, they're both right. They're both right. So theology is all, uh, scripture t- is tied together. And that's what we'll look at too also in this course. All its parts are united in some way. The book of Revelation is united to the book of Genesis and vice versa. All the Bible is united. It's one book. In systematic theology, now we'll get into just briefly what we're going to learn in these classes. In systematic theology, you'll see in fact how this is done. The doctrine of creation is connected to the doctrine of end times. The doctrine of man, anthropology, is connected to the doctrine of God. We're created in God's image. We're connected to God. The doctrine of sin and the fall is connected to the doctrine of salvation. You can't have one without the other. If you don't fall, you have no salvation. These things are all connected. And all of these things are in the Bible. And they're all connected. And then further, in biblical theology, in our third class, you'll see how the doctrines move forward in history. It's it's like a historical way of looking at doctrines in the sense of revelation, what we call progressive revelation. You know, Moses didn't know what David knew. David knew more about God and his plan than Moses knew. Revelation progressed, and we got the full picture in our hands. We got everything. We got much more than Moses. I always tell people that. You know, oh, if I could only be like Moses on the mountain, you know, seeing his face, you know, you know. But you got much more than that. After the fall in the garden, God said in Genesis 3.15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and your seed. This is a progressive, this is the first uh, step in the progressive revelation of salvation. Basically, That text means a Savior's coming. A Savior is on its way. But it's in seed form, as we say. It's introduced there. And Romans 16.20 says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan. It goes back to that text. Under your feet. So it's tied together. And these things are all progressively revealed in the Bible. We've got to move a little faster here. Now, what's the benefits of this to the believer? First of all, we see that God's word has order. There's order to God's word. It's just not a bunch of things thrown out, jambled up, but there's order to God's word. All these doctrines start somewhere, and they go somewhere, or they end somewhere in the Bible. Biblical revelation is historical in the sense that God moved in history. It's God moving in history. We see this, in fact, in Abraham's call. This is the first call of the believers, of what what became all believers in Christ. It happened in Genesis 11. And then soon, uh, Jacob had 12 sons who were, that that thing was growing. Now it's 12 sons. And soon it became all peoples of all the earth. So we see how how how, how it progresses, right, brethren? You see how it progresses? The called out family progresses forward. Started with Abraham, and right now it's with each of you, Lord willing, if you're saved. You're part of that family. Amen? You're part of that family. Well, at each stage, biblical history had a goal. And God's the ultimate goal of biblical history. He's the goal. And it says in Romans 11.36, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. That's the goal. The glory of God. Amen? The glory of, of, of God. And brethren, that's simply biblical theology, and we'll get into that. 
Next we see exegetical theology, and this will be much briefer. This looks at the Bible in its individual parts, the Old Testament, the New Testament. It also gets into languages. And, uh, and, and basically exege exegesis or exegetical theology means to take out from the Bible. We don't add to the Bible how many people try to do. They try to add their things to the Bible. No, the exegetical theologian takes out of the Bible. That's the resource. Not adding a word, but exegetical theology is a taking out from the word, brethren. And here, your knowledge will grow of the whole Bible as you understand this theology. And the last two theologies are a bit different in the sense that they don't come directly from the Bible. These are practical theologies in the sense of historical theology and pastoral theologies, like systematic theology, exegetical theology, and biblical theology. These are all taken directly from Scripture. But these other two are a look at church history. And we'll just briefly mention this. It's basically his story. That's the word history. It's his story that we're going to look at. And, and that's what we learn in there. In that. And the benefits of that are magnificent. When you know the history of the church, you know where the church went wrong, and you know where the church got it right. So you don't make the same mistakes. So you learn in that. Now, I'll put some things online to the benefits of, the, of historical theology. I'll give you ten benefits of that. I'll, I'll post them on Facebook. Anybody who's not part of that will get you there. And uh, we'll do that to you. We'll get that to you very shortly. The last theology is practical theology, or pastoral theology, which covers missions. Missions are involved in that, teaching, preaching, even creeds and confessions. And there's great benefits, brethren, in these things, the creeds. Don't think the creeds are dead and the confessions are dead. Believe me, these things are alive. They've got to be used rightly. They're not scripture. But these things are alive. I, I recommend you go through a creed once a year, like the, like the London Baptist Confession or the Westminster Confession. Go through these things. It'll, it'll spark revival in your life, brethren. The benefits are astronomical in this. And we'll, we'll, we'll get into this as we get into that class. And, uh, and even, brethren, even, even understanding pastoral theology, what we'll learn in that is to how to understand a sermon, to get benefits from, so you'll know what the pastor does, to, you know, we'll, we'll touch on this briefly, what the pastor does in his putting together a sermon in that course itself. And then it'll give us the ability to follow a sermon better. You'll know what that man did to put that thing together. So there's benefits, benefits for mission work, benefits for teaching, even women on women. You know, there's so many benefits. And brethren, this course is more than theology, head theology. It is a lifestyle, brethren. It is a worldview that'll go on and on and on when this class is over. This is a lifestyle of learning things. This does not end. These tools will benefit you, brethren, immensely. Immensely. Each one of you will, in fact, grow. Wherever you are in your walk, some of you are at the early stages of your walk, some of you are at the later. Listen, I wish somebody would have told me this when I was, I was in a church for 10 years. I, I was like a cotton candy eating Christian for 10 years. You know, seriously, I knew nothing. All I know is Jesus loves me, and this I know. You know, basically, seriously, it's very, very sad. These things will benefit you, brother, because they'll give you the tools who you are in Christ, who you are, and what God's plan for each of you is. God has a plan for each of you, brother, and that's beneficial. Not only will you have orthodox, right doctrine, but we hope you that you'll have orthopraxis. Praxis is the word. And that means a right, practical working out of that right doctrine. Don't get scared of these terms. Not at all. Brethren, it's all tied together. The Bible is all tied together. We can't leave these things in our head. If you leave these things in your head, I failed. No, that's dead theology, brethren. We need to have a practical outworking of these things that we're learning here, that we will learn here amidst our trials, amidst our pains that we have in life, amidst the joys that you have in life. Whatever you feel, brethren, theology will give you the tools to survive. It'll, it'll, it'll make you, even the psalmist, you know, you read the psalms and the, and the psalmist, whoa, you know, the, everything's oppressing me. But what does it do? It leads him to a right practical outworking of his orthodoxy. 
He says, I will call on the God who answers me. So you see, we'll tend to think, who oh, is me, and go hide in a room, you know? But if you do like the psalmist, his, his emotional state brought him to God, not away from God, to God. And that's a right working out of your theology, brethren. That's what we want to do. We tend to, uh, you know, uh, I'm, you know I, I can't do this. I'm going home. You know, no. Let your emotions drive you to Christ. To Christ, brethren. That's what we want to do. This is doing theology, brethren. This ain't just learning theology. This is doing theology. Living for God. For His glory. For His glory. And to bring about salvation and even revival in each of your lives. So, brethren, I ask you to come on this journey with me. Come on this journey with me. You will not be sad that you've done it. Come on this journey with me. Wherever you are in your walk, you might be a brand new Christian even. This stuff will benefit you. It will benefit you. You will grow and you will be blessed. It's a given fact. Step by step, day by day, until we are in fact with Christ and our bodies and our minds will be made whole again. This thing never ends, brethren. I've been studying this stuff for 10 years and I just keep going and going and going and, and I'm getting more excited. I, I hope you can see that. I'm getting more excited about this, you know, to be blessed. This is my goal, to bless you. Not just to keep this and say, oh, I got, I got a treasure here. I'm cool, you know. No! I want to give that treasure to you. Give them, give them tools to you. Give that jackhammer to you, you know, and, and get whatever it is, the hammer, the screwdriver, but in a spiritual mindset, you know. Step by step, you'll learn. When all things will be revealed. When the veil, you know, there's a text in, I think it's Deuteronomy 29, 29, that we see through a, 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 a dimly, you know, a dimly glass-colored thing. We see dimly. Even when we know these things, we see thimly, dimly. But one day, when we see the Lord, that dimness will be gone. The veil will be, you know, you know, it was ripped in two on, on, at the cross, but the, the veil that we see through will be taken up and thrown away. But until that day, brethren, let's walk on this journey together. You and me, all of us together, even those listening, let's go hand in hand, brother and sister, Jew and Gentile even, one in Messiah, let's go on this journey together. And I close with one text alone. John 17, verse 3. And this, brethren, is eternal life, that we may know Him, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Amen. Amen. Well, we have a couple of minutes, like two or three minutes. Anybody have any questions? And I'll, uh, 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 we'll give you uh, the Facebook page. If you're not, we, 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 you can post questions on that if you think. Anybody have any quick questions? about what we're doing here, the direction we'll be heading in. Anything? Anything about today? Anything about the future? Yes, Sandra. When you say for 10 years you did studying, but what made you start studying? How did you get excited? <sighs> I understood the sovereignty of God. That's what did. When I understood the sovereignty of God and the Lord, the Lord of all, I was like, I don't know this God. To me... You know, God was my homeboy. He was my friend, you know. We walked in the garden together, you know. You know, speaking, you know, um, not literally, but, you know, you know, you know how the hymn goes. And when I understood what God was and, and, his, and his fullness of sovereignty, and then I started getting into contact with great teachers and, and guys who encouraged me to read, and uh, that started it all. That started it all. And I, I have not been the same since. <laughs> yes, brother.
you end up joking around. I know Christians that joke around. Yeah, yeah, I love my car. Yeah, it goes 80 miles an hour, and they have no sense of, of guilt that you're traveling 80 miles an hour. No, I know. You know, you know, theology says, don't you know the Bible talks about traveling God to bring your life for babies? You know, it's a human system, so it does make a difference in your walk. Amen. Amen. Yes, brother. Knowing that, uh, that knowledge produces pride, what, what can you do? What steps should you take uh, that not to happen? To well, the bottom line is it's all grace. It's grace you're sitting here. It's grace I know what I know. It's all grace. And just be humbled. Just be humbled every day. Uh, this is not head knowledge. This is life knowledge, practical knowledge that work out your life. You know, if you, if you start getting there, uh, come to me and I'll <laughs> <Sweet. laughs> we'll talk to you. <laughs> yes, Joseph. I really appreciate that emphasis that you brought back. Practical knowledge, yeah. I think, I think when theology is working right, it, it just sets the life on fire. Right, right, you know? right. Uh, and that's not going to bring pride. Right, right. And, right. and when you learn about, like you said, about learning the sovereignty of God, right. which comes under you know, right, right. understanding right. theology, right. Uh, you're only going to be humble by that. Right, you're, right. You're, right. you're knowing God. Yeah. People use the same argument with the doctrines of, of, uh, of sovereign grace. They say, if you get that stuff, you're going to be, oh, I'm elected, you know. You know, it brings you to your knees. You've done nothing. <laughs> you're lucky you brought your sin. <laughs> but, uh, yes, brother. We, we got, like, last real, question. Sure, sure. Uh, I just want to make an observation. That just something I thought about the past couple of days. Thank God for his word and his Holy Spirit and the discernment he gives us. Because when I first started going to a church through an invitation to somebody, what brought me there was the preaching and teaching the pastor, and, and why did I leave over 10 years later, was the preaching and teaching of the pastor, and so then I had to focus, well, you know what, that's why it's so important to stay in tune with uh, with God, and let his Holy Spirit speak to you with his word, and not rely on the preaching and teaching of the man. There's doctrines of men, and there's right. doctrines of God. Doctrines of man will give you a, a good job to do at church, and get you busy. Right. But doctrines of God will give you busy for God. And, and you might get a job at church, too, but, but it'll be for God, and not, not to keep you busy. Amen, brother? So will anybody who doesn't have the Facebook page, we'll give it to you. Uh, let me know, and, uh, and, and shoot me any questions on Facebook so we can all be a part of it. That would be the best way. You know, we have a Facebook page devoted.